good evening, everybody. Could you all hear me just fine? Great, hi. Thanks for joining us on this Saturday late afternoon, um, giving us some of your time to discuss about a very important topic. Um, this is following one of our study that we have just published recently on the attitude towards violence against women. So all of you who are here today are um, very important participants of, of our conversation. So we want to hear you out. Feel very free to drop in any questions or concerns you have in our chat box. The moderators and the coordinators will be pinning some of the questions that we will have the time to answer later on. Otherwise, then just feel free to tune in. That's okay if you don't want to speak or ask anything as well. Just feel free to tune in and hear us out. I think this is also a very important part of the conversation. Now, before we begin, I do want to let all of you know that there are um, certain trigger warnings to today's conversation. We will be talking about some very sensitive or personal um, intimate parts of consent and women's autonomy over their body. Some of them might be triggering to you. It is completely all right if you want to leave the chat, leave the conversation and take a step back and know that if anything, at the end of the day, if you feel like you need some extra support or you feel like um, there are certain questions you have, right, or there are certain questions you have, that you'd like to channel to WAO, our email and hotline will be made available for you after today's conversation. So you can feel free to reach out to us, okay? Now I'm going to be starting right now. I'm going to be just introducing what's today's conversation about. And then I'm going to be intri briefly introducing our statistics and findings from the study. There will be a link that links you right to the study published on our website already. So you can feel free to read the full study over there. I'm not going to go much into it today. I'm just going to talk briefly about the stats. And then after that, I'll be introducing our very lovely speakers for today who have kindly agreed to be today's panelists, sharing their very personal conversations and perceptions on consent as well. So do note that um, this is just a conversation. We want to try to make it as approachable and lay as possible to the general public. So we are inviting any opinions, um, whether very technical, academical, or something just as lay as wanting to get a very simple question answered. That's, that's okay as well. We welcome any questions and concerns you have. All right. Okay, now I'm going to start by introducing myself first. So my name is Jean. I'm a registered clinical psychologist working as a services outreach and psychosocial coordinator in women's aid organization. So I hold a master's in clinical psychology. My profession, that's um, what I do. I provide mental health diagnosis, mental health treatment. At the same time, I'm also using my clinical platform to raise awareness for the impact of trauma onto our survivors. So I am focusing a lot on trauma healing and advocating for the rights of marginalized groups. I've been with WAO since I was in, I was a volunteer in 2015, and I'm mostly involved in the services department where I'm providing um, support through hotline and the text messaging tool. I also work as a social worker before, so um, I'm quite familiar with um, WAO's framework in trying to provide services to survivors. And on our panel today, we have Kirit, who is a capacity building officer from WAO. Kirit, would you like to wave hi? Yes, so Kirit is a intersectional feminist and activist in Malaysia who believes that everybody has a role to play in the fight for gender inequality. Currently, she serves as a capacity building officer. She engages mostly with change makers, university students to grassroots women and girls in her work towards shaping perceptions and changing mindsets for this work that we are doing in WEO. Next up, we have Jasmine King. Jasmine King is a sex positive advocate. She is passionate about creating sex positive and sexually empowering spaces and conversation especially around in Southeast Asian, from a Southeast Asian perspective. She does so through community engagements via her sex positive platform. Um, it's an Instagram handle, just explains. She also hosts an Asian sex podcast called I Wish Someone Told Me. Jasmine, would you like to say hi? 
Hi, everybody. It's nice to see everybody. And I'm, I'm super excited for today. Thank you. And last but not least, we have Ira Roslan. She is a public relations manager and a DJ. She's also, um, she believes that authenticity is the cornerstone of self-empowerment. So that's really important to her. And she takes pride in being a connector for her community. Her work has included many, or, um, many parts of organizing community initiatives as she leverages on her platforms, her social media platforms to raise awareness. Ira, would you like to say hi? Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. So today we have three of these very lovely panelists are very experienced and considered an expertise in their respective fields. So we have all of them later on to share their perspectives and what it means, what consent means to them. Okay. Now, as to introduce today's discussion, so as you all know, today's forum builds on the study we have, WAO has, on the Malaysian public attitudes and perceptions towards violence against women. It is the first nationally representative study on public attitudes towards violence against women in Malaysia. So the study mainly looks at public attitudes. We know um, there's a lot of evidence-based data available. There's a lot of studies available on the trauma impact, but how many times right, do we actually get to see public attitudes being studied instead? So this is one of Malaysia's first here, and we have a sample of 1,000 respondents. So it's, it may not be a lot in a large scale, but this perspective actually speaks volume. The study explores Malaysians' attitudes towards understanding gender equality and violence against women, specifically domestic violence, rape, sexual harassment, stalking, and child marriage. This is just so that we get what they truly feel and understand about violence against women, of course, from an anonymous perspective. One of the biggest findings in the study is that Malaysians actually do still have a strong disregard for women's rights to consent. Now, what we found in the study is that actually only about a third, which is about 34.3% of the respondents in the study, express support for the idea of consent. That's two thirds that don't. The recognition for women's right of consent is so important because this acknowledges that there is an autonomy of women over their own body. Something that seems so, so easy for us to grasp, but if we are looking from a large scale from a Malaysia's um, society perspective, it's still a foreign concept. There is a societal recognition that um, practicing consent and the importance of practicing consent may not be as important just yet. But we know through the many scientific studies out there that the recognition of acknowledging consent, especially among women, is so, so important to steer us away from the victim-blaming culture. However, we do want to look at what this means, right? This high level of disregard for consent. What does it say? So it might suggest that these behaviors may extend beyond the intimate situation in women's lives. And we see it every day already. We see it being translated every day. We see it being translated in rape myths, right? We hear rape jokes um, being, being very normalized in everyday conversations. We see victim blaming in in everyday news, in the comment section of social media posts. We see the very blatant disregard for distressing situation women face when they have their consent denied, or even feeling so shy and ashamed that they do not um, dare to comment to anybody about how they had to give in in very uncomfortable situation. So in this study, there's also another finding that says around half of the Malaysians believe that rape happens because of how a woman, how the women act or dresses. While over 80%, which is a majority of it, believe that rape happens because men are not able to control their sexual desires. So these are really specific um, findings we have. Again, this is not to generalize the entire Malaysian, of course just limited to the thousand respondents who responded to our study. But, you know, it actually seems pretty alarming that this is a majority, over 80%, that believes it's because men cannot control their sexual desires. 
What happens with this study and this belief, you ask me? It actually normalizes toxic behaviors towards women, such as minimizing women's experiences of harassment, feeling entitled over women's or girls' bodies. Like um, we've seen the recent news, period spot, spot checks um, by teachers in school. Or we see that um, if, if there's a news article being published online about sexual violence, we see the very casual conversation about how the woman is not dressed appropriately, how she was asking for it, or how there are jokes like, oh, you know, I, would, I, I don't mind being raped by her. Very, very blatant, dismissive, and inappropriate conversations like this has been going on in our community. So that brings us to today and why it is so important for WAO to continue to do this, this work of raising awareness on sexual, uh, on the um, fighting against sexual violence. The panel will dive into the conversation of consent and more. We are going to try to contextualize the findings of this um, attitude towards violence study to real life lived experiences of women our panelists and our lovely participants today who occupy prominent spaces on social media so that they would share their insights, their ideals and their perspectives on consent, having autonomy on their body and how they plan to fight um, misogynistic remarks happening every day in our lives. And again, I just want to put this out there again. Um, this conversation, uh, this panel might include mentions of violence against women rape, domestic violence, or any um, quite sensitive and uncomfortable topics to some. You're welcome to leave anytime if you are uncomfortable. You're also free to reach out to our hotline. Uh, we'll show it at the end of the session later on. If you have any questions to ask about sexual violence and if you, need, you find the need to seek WAO services, all right? So um, that's our introduction for today. I'd like to dive into the very, very important question that was set the foundation of our tone for our discussion, which is the meaning of consent, right? So before we talk about consent, we obviously want to know what it means, especially to our lovely panelists. Um, let's start with our very own capacity building officer, Kira. What do you think consent means? Okay, so um, I, uh, Planned Parenthood, came up with this really great acronym um, for us to think about what does, uh, what does, what constitutes consent, right? Uh, consent is complex in once, um, and this acronym is thrice, you know, like McDonald's fries. So F is for freely given. Consent must be freely given um, without any pressure and of free will, yeah? R, R is reversible. When you give consent, you can also revoke consent, right? It is not something that we give and then cannot take back. We can change our mind. We are always free to change our minds, yeah? I is consent is informed. This means the person understands um, what they are consenting to. They understand the consequences of what they consent to as well. Um, this is really key, yeah? Uh, e is for enthusiastic. When this person, uh, when when you when you give consent or when you uh, get consent from someone, it has to be enthusiastic, right? Um, that person must want to. Um, we're talking a lot about um, sexual intercourse, right? So that, that person must want to have sexual relationships with you. They must be excited about it. Yeah. Um, and S is specific, right? When somebody gives consent, um, uh, they are specific about what they are giving consent to. Right? Um, you cannot agree to A and then assume that the other person wants to do ABC, right? Um, so this is a really good acronym for us to sort of think about what constitutes consent. Consent. How do you come about in getting um, full wholesome consent? Yeah. Um, I just want to go through a bit about how consent is defined under Malaysian law. Um, consent is not um, specifically defined, it is defined in the context of rape. Yeah. Um, in Malaysia, our laws are extremely heteronormative, um, and rape is defined as sexual intercourse with a woman against her without her consent. Yeah. Um, it, 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 
it concludes that um, rape occurs when consent is obtained by putting fear or threat or pressure. Okay, that is not consent. Uh, that is rape. When the person, when the person um, who has experienced the assault is unable uh, unable to understand um, the nature or the consequences of what they are consenting to, right? Um, it is also rape when consent is obtained by using a position of authority, um, a professional relationship, or a relationship of trust. Yeah, um, this is really important. Um, I I do think that. Um, although the definition is heteronormative, it does fall under or a lot of the um, the, the definitions of rights is taken into account. Yeah, um, and the age of uh, consent in Malaysia is sixteen years old. Right, that means if you you if you are older than sixteen and you have sexual intercourse with somebody who is under sixteen, um, that is also rape. Yeah, um, so this is how consent is defined under Malaysian law. Yeah. Right. So while they are trying to build on that framework that you mentioned earlier, the price framework, correct me if I, if I say <laughs> it wrongly. Um, so the, it seems to me there are still some loopholes over there, right? Like while we talk a lot about autonomy in women's bodies, but I see that they, use, they really use uh, gender roles to define yeah. rape and consent in our Malaysian law. That gives rise to a lot of loopholes. I think along the way, you will see cases of men being raped and that really gets overlooked. Unfortunately, yeah. right. Okay, now bringing the focus to Jasmine, what do you think consent means to you? So for me, I mean, first of all, I love that Kirat was um, really specifying the Malaysian law in the mm. context of consent. I think that's really, really important because a lot of times we have this kind of vague idea of what consent is, but we don't really know specifically what the law is. So for me, I always, I'm, and I'm a big advocate when it comes to consent and it comes to boundaries. So for me, I define consent as a full body experience. It's not just a simple yes or no. It is how the person's body is like, you know, because sometimes they would say yes, but actually the whole body, you can actually just see that like, okay, this person actually doesn't want it. Or they would say no, but then actually the gesture is like, mm, yes, you know, so it's a full body experience. And most of the time, sometimes we get our information sort of, we get confusing signals, right? We're not sure if it's a yes, if it's a no. And to that, I would always say, if you are not sure whether it is a yes, it is a no, it is a no. <laughs> it's like, then automatically no, because we don't want to take any chances. If you're really not sure, ask that person. And sometimes also that person might not know what to say or do not want to sort of um, hurt your feelings or you don't want to hurt the other person's feelings. So, you know, it just is, is an immediate no. So. Yeah, um, consent is a full body experience. It is not just verbally yes or no. It is also a body thing. It is also a facial expression thing. Um, and just like what Kirit was saying, just because you said yes to one thing doesn't mean that you say yes to B, C, D until Z. Uh, it's not a, you, it's like a token. You need to top up the token. So every time you say yes to something and then you like ask again, can I this one? And then, you know, don't assume. But mm. Yeah, that's consent to me. So for, for just me, for your experience, it's more like if you're even remotely unsure, to be safe, it's a no, right? So that is how we fully respect the body autonomy, not just for a partner to a partner, but even respecting your own autonomy towards yourself. So maybe if you are not too sure, then to be safe, you're just refrain. Yes. Yes, and I love that you say like autonomy towards yourself as well, because sometimes we f we are so focused on giving consent or asking for consent from other people that we yeah. completely ignore our own consent, what we are comfortable with. Yeah. That's true. So it really comes from your own comfort, your own um, boundaries as well. Yeah. Ira, do you share the same thoughts? Yeah, exactly. Um, I was just going to say that consent is really exercising your right to make the decisions about your body, not, no matter what the scenario, not necessarily um, in a sexual interaction, but with anything, right? It's active permission. Mm -hmm. So active because you have to be intentional and continuously aware of that boundary, what you're allowing into your space and what you're bringing into another person's space. So I think with consent as well, um, there's a lot of communication that needs mm -hmm. to happen and communicating and being direct and very clear about what you need, what you want, what you can allow, and also listen and respect to what the other person needs and wants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much, Yura, for your explanation as well. That 
conversation of consent, building the foundation of that, it's still something so foreign to most Malaysians. Um, consent recently um, came about as a very important topic, probably because of the whole social media movement, the Me Too movement, and a lot of times when we are calling out sexual assaulters and harassers on social media. So the term consent and the conversation around it has slowly resurfaced over these few years, which I find that extremely great. But at the same time, this kind of exposes us, uh, brings the awareness of certain rape myths and rape jokes still being circulated out there. Sometimes hearing them on social media might further put back our survivors or anyone with any concerns about um, consent or rape at all to try to stand up for themselves because of these jokes, because of this myth. So when we talk about rape myths, and it's something quite concerning from our study as well, we see that many of them still do not believe um, women autonomy and they are normalizing rape myths and rape jokes on on in their everyday lives. What do you guys think of this result? Do you find that really surprising when you see the study? Um, to be honest, for me, I wasn't surprised. I, you know, the whole when they say about the rape, rape myths about kind of, oh, it, it, like that, lah, what, what was she wearing? You know, or confirm, lah, kuna, you know, or like, uh, oh, they can't tahan themselves, the men can't control and urges and stuff like that. I think it's just, am I surprised? Not really. Am I disappointed? Very much so. Because I think it is 2022 and yet we're still kind of stuck in this, you know, limited knowledge of like all these rape myths and just really, really upsetting. And I think you mentioned earlier about, you know, the, this, the whole idea of consent, it's something very simple, but it's a lot of the times, a lot of people still don't understand, a lot of people still don't find it important, which is mind blowing for me. It's very simple, but it's really upsetting. I've recently, so for my personal story, I've recently, um, a few weeks ago, probably a month ago, I went on a date and, um, and that person, so that person expects that you know like he would be invited up to my room because he paid for food and everything even though I pushed very much so to pay for my meal so he was really upset that you know he couldn't go up and he was just really you know throwing a tantrum and everything he just texting me non-stop long messages until late at night and then and then I told some of my guy friends about it and of course they were very upset and they said that that shouldn't be it but then there's one person one guy who I don't really know but I just told him the story and then he said it's you know it's your fault because oh. you know it's your fault right because he invested in you you should have of course he's going to be upset that mm -hmm. he's not going to be invited up what do you expect and I, I was like but that's not normal that's being very that's that's not right and he's like well that is what men are like and you should know better and mm -hmm. I said you know I I think I was still processing whatever he was saying and I I should blame myself but then I should have said then that this is the problem you are part of the problem and this can be solved if only you take yourself out of this whole rape culture this whole toxic masculinity all of this thing so yeah i don't know where i was going with that but it was just a personal story of this rape culture and rape myth and all of that no right. thanks for sharing that justine i think that is so important to further call people out like like that i think that's a really courageous act that you were doing like you knew that he was perpetrating the problem that we are fighting so hard to break down and i'm, I'm not too sure if he got the point but i'm ho hopefully he did but it's so true that you know just because a person pays for your meal it doesn't automatically mean he has autonomy over your body and that's exactly what is the whole point of our consent conversation today Right. So thanks for sharing that really personal experience. And I'm also wondering, you know, how does this impact like someone's professional or public life? Um, Ira, you, you, you do have some fair share of experiences working with the public. How do you find that? Yeah, um, I mean, I think that there's this constant narrative that's been ingrained into us about this gender dynamic, which is what we're really trying to change, right? And um, the same way that Jasmine had that guy feel the sense of entitlement, I've had situations like that where a man would think that, oh, because um, you put yourself out there, because you interact with people in a public way, that means I have a, a right over you and, and to say whatever it is that I want to say and break those boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this is something I've, I've discussed in uh, previous 
conversations about someone who was um, sending really lewd messages uh, about my friend and I because we were wearing um, we were after a run and we were wearing sports bras, which is sports attire essentially. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But he was saying all these nasty things, and it really it really felt so it felt violating because this is something that had that there was no intention of being a sexual person or or coming off that way and then we're we're seen as such right and i'm talking about like um this this narrative that we've always been fed like even when when we were younger how we're told not to dress manjolok mata so that men don't feel aroused when they look at us it's like, why do we need to do a certain thing so that you keep yourself in check? You know, and I think that's um, that's what perpetuates this this culture. And um, the fact that there are so many rape jokes and people just doing these rape jokes or making these rape jokes show that, that the severity of rape isn't even taken very seriously as an act of violence. Um, you know, I've seen on other social media comments when rape is used like uh, I think Jasmine mentioned before, to viciously attack people. And they, or not actually, I think it was Eugene that you said, you know, like, and, and some people, they'll like post photos that some men deem inappropriate. And the comment that I see at the bottom there is, oh, by a will do. You know, in a way to say like, oh, what, what is she wearing? Mm -hmm. Like, that's really not nothing to do with you, actually. Yeah. yeah. And that really perpetuates the victim blaming culture. Like we are responsible for your actions and your reaction to what's this, which yeah. is pretty unfair. Yeah. Yeah. I, sometimes, I mean, admittedly, I fear wearing certain clothes to places where I know that there's more people with that kind of mentality. So I, in turn, just dress modestly. Mm -hmm. But in a way, it's like, why do I need to do that? And why do I need to observe that when my fear really stems from someone pointing out something that I was wearing in case something did happen to me. I like, that's the last thing I would want anyone to say that, oh, it's my fault for going to this place, knowing that it's this kind of place. And I wore this thing. Mm. It shouldn't be like that at all. And that's exactly what we're trying to break down. And that's why we're trying to normalize this conversation about upholding our own autonomy over our own body and not giving anyone a chance to say that we are responsible for mm. their actions and reactions at all. Mm. Yeah. All right. Um, Kirith, how do you find the rape culture and the rape myths, you know, affecting your own professional personal lives, if any? So um, I just wanted to say, Jasmine and Ira, like, it is your right to feel safe mm. in a public space. It's not a privilege, you know. Um, and I think um, the more we think about how um, feeling safe uh, is a right, the more we understand that we deserve that space, you know. And we as women are always taught to not kick up a fuss, to be accommodating, you know, but it is our right. So we should kick up a fuss, you know, and we should be less accommodating. <laughs> um, so I was um, surprised uh, and not surprised. I was surprised um, at how high, um, uh, how high these endorsing behaviors were of uh, rape myths. Uh, but I knew obviously from personal experience and just living as a woman in Malaysia, um, that these are really common. Um, and I think that um, rape myths, victim, uh, victim blaming and things like that are all just uh, a product of the patriarchy, you know? Um, uh, through, this, um, through this, we all sort of perpetuate this rape culture, right? Um, um, I'm, I'm not sure how much everybody knows about rape culture, so maybe I can sort of quickly explain, right? Um, so the definition of rape culture is how we as a society, as a community, feel that rape is inevitable. Rape is something that is inevitable that would happen to women in our community. Um, and when I first read this definition, obviously I am um, summarizing it a bit, but when I first read this definition, I was very taken aback because, I mean, that is, that is a bold statement, right? To say that a community believes that women will, there's no way of avoiding rape, okay? But the more that you think about it, the more that you sort of like uh, break it down through the experiences that you, you have experienced yourself, through things that you have seen happen around you, you realize that 
um, there are behaviors that we practice, okay? Um, and these behaviors are stacked on one on top of the other, with, which essentially leads to rape and assault of women, right? Uh, or generally rape and assault, okay? We start with behaviors that, are, that people say are, are jokes or we are, where we are being too sensitive. So sexist attitudes, right? When you have a sexist attitude, you normalize the degradation of women. You think women are less than, right? Cat calling, right? Unwanted sexual touch. When you touch somebody, not in a sexual way, but you don't ask their permission, right? We're talking about consent. And that's why we call it the practice of consent or culture of consent, you know? Because um, you practice consent in everyday life, not just in a sexual relationship or in a sexual context context stalking right stalking online stalking in person rape jokes um our famous locker room banter these are all products of rape culture right and these are the foundations of this pyramid of behaviors that normalize the degradation of women right then we go up to things like um non-consensual uh, sharing of non-consensual intimate images we go to coercion and manipulation uh we go to victim blaming and shaming where your rape where your rape meets sit right and then we move on to assault right um it, it can be something like stealthing you know uh molestation whatever other forms of sexual assault which sit at the top of this rape this pyramid of rape culture Right, so all of these behaviors and uh, behaviors at the bottom, the tolerance of the behaviors at the bottom, supports the behaviors on the top, excuses the behaviors on the top. So we as a society perpetuate this. Right, you can just look at it. Look at any article posted online talking about sexual assault. You will see the comments. Um, I think um, uh, uh, look at Ayn. Ayn is a child. Right, and she has faced so much victim blaming and so much uh, uh, violence online. Yeah, um, so that is rape myths are part of rape culture, and pe people who engage in perpetuating these rape myths, perpetuating victim blaming, are are perpetuating rape culture. Right, um, so this is how we as a community. Um, so when I say that, I believe everybody has a hand in achieving gender equality and achieving a safe space for all of us. This is where we come in, right? Um, calling out these behaviors and saying, hey, that's not okay. Don't do that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's what I think. I think um, this is all part of rape culture and uh, whether we choose to perpetuate it is a lot in our hands. Yeah. I think I really like how you extend the con conversation of consent to go beyond intimate relationship, beyond sexual relationship, and talk a lot about the consent around everyday unwanted advances done upon women, right? Yeah. Whether it be catcalling, um, whether it be stalking, um, having some person just relentlessly try to reach out to you despite your many yeah. ways. Yeah, these are the things that people don't usually see, but it really creates a very lasting impact on one psyche. And thanks for sharing that very, very intimate um, perspective on how consent goes beyond just relationship. Now, um, to the other speakers as well, I'm wondering if you ever find any difficulties or struggles having to maneuver through uh, trying to break rape culture down, you know, in your personal and your professional work life, uh, work experiences. Um. I think for me personally, so I run a sex positive platform yeah. where a lot of it has to do with educating about, you know, sexual wellness and consent and boundaries. And, you know, a lot of the times uh, I get messages from men who would send me messages and would, you know, like, oh, I have questions and I love getting messages from men. Uh, from men and women, but in whatever, for all genders, but especially from straight cis men, because a lot of times it's the straight men who have issues kind of talking to someone about what they're going through. And it's really special when men comes to me and say like, hey, I have this question. But more often than not, unfortunately, I have to be very careful when men send me messages because sometimes they will come in and they will ask you this question, but then actually they have an ulterior motive because they would say like, actually, can you look at my penis? And then when, when I say no, 
Um, and they're like, oh, no, but I don't understand because you're talking about sex and everything like that. So sometimes I would engage in a way where I come in to educate and tell them like, okay, this is not how you talk to people, blah, 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 blah. And most of the time they actually do get it. They would go like, oh, I'm really sorry. Because a lot of the times these men are like young men. Right. They're like young men, teenagers and stuff like that. And most of the time they don't know. There are other times when, you know, they get really, they get really like, you know, oh, but, you know, you're, you do this already and then you're like, you to show yourself this way and everything like those are the ones that I don't engage so they are the ones that I try to talk to and try to have a conversation they actually listen they actually apologize sincerely apologize they're those who don't um so through my platform those are the ways where I kind of engage but also sort of you know talk to to create conversations I love conversations so conversations such as these are really important to really talk about concern and boundaries and dispelling all of the myths I don't know if I'm talking I feel like I'm, I'm going out of tangent um, no, this is great I really like to hear in. all these personal experiences you have yeah definitely keep going yeah um yeah but it's it's I think it's it, when I first started I think with sex positivity especially in Malaysia I was a lot of people were asking whether it is actually, do people actually need this? And to be honest, ever since I started, there were a lot of conversations of people actually coming up to me and asking me like, is this normal? Is this not normal? I had one, one person, um, a young woman who experienced GBV, um, gender-based violence in her workplace. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of these men would say horrible, horrible things like, oh, you know, oh, your thighs are so so white I imagine if I put you know, my hands in there or you know you're you're very you know the way you walk it's like you know so and then they just wanted to so they would come to me and they would talk to me about it they unpack it with me and then we will talk have a conversation that has been helpful especially for me and having this sort of conversation um mm. but yeah sorry I'm like <laughs> but, but One yeah conversation time, yeah. Is, yeah are important yeah, and that's how you break down. That's how you maneuver through the rape, um, breaking down rape culture in your professional and your personal space, right? I think I really like how you mentioned earlier when um, the, the guy sincerely asked you a very lewd question, but you chose to take the high road and you took the education approach instead and that person stepped down and, and sincerely apologized. I think that's a really good step at trying to break down the rape culture currently exist um, in our in our society so instead of approaching that that person with shame and a lot of anger you really chose to take the high road and um, a nurturing approach instead yeah that's great um, how about for Jasmine how do you find that you have to maneuver through this kind of imp very very inappropriate rape myth and rape jokes happening around me yeah Ira. <laughs> oh so sorry Ira <laughs> um you know, I, as a DJ, I work in nightlife. Um, I think this is probably a topic that we should kind of touch on as well, is that when it comes to consent, when it comes to uh, rape culture and rape myths, um, victim blaming happens a lot when the victim is intoxicated. Yes. And when someone is intoxicated, a lot of times they then become... Um, vulnerable and uh, when when something tragic happens to them it becomes then their fault um, that people say mm -hmm. but that's really not the, the case and I think it's like a two-way thing right consent isn't something that you like I said earlier that you give but you also someone in a culture of consent like how Kira said just now are always mindful of what the other person is consenting to mm -hmm. from their body language from um, whether they can even make words at, at the time and how lucid they are, right? So consent is not just a checkbox that's ticked off one time. At the start of an interaction, it's ongoing. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I think just living in that fear as well is something that's the, the being perpetuated by rape culture and rape myths that right. people are afraid of, um, you know, having their drink roofied or... Um, getting themselves into a situation where at the start of the night you think you want to go back with this guy and then suddenly you realize no I don't want to I don't want to do this and then you feel obligated to stay um, actually it's kind of happened to me at one point before where yeah I agreed to allow the person 
to where to come to where I was. And then as we started getting into it, I realized, no, I don't want to do this. And, you know, this whole idea of leading people on, leading him on, letting him have this idea that you were willing to do something and then revoking that, going back to fries, it's reversible. Um, and then when I said no, he seemed to feel like he had uh, ownership over me and he kind of pushed me down oh. and I was in a vulnerable position, but thankfully I managed to escape by, you know, using some physical force and then uh, we, I, I left. Sorry, yeah. that sounds very traumatizing. So, yeah, and you know, these are situations that I think at the time when it happened to me, I felt a lot of guilt because mm. I'm like, oh, I shouldn't have drank too much. I shouldn't have asked him come. I shouldn't have done this, that. And then I didn't, I didn't really talk about it. I never really said anything. Of course, at the time, I didn't know how to deal with those feelings. And then now having the knowledge and, and really understanding what consent truly means is the reason why I never have to feel like guilty or insecure if anything like that were to happen to me again. It's absolutely their fault. Yeah. Because you have rights and autonomy over your body. Yeah. I'm sorry. It seems like that that rape culture, that, that victim blaming tendency has been internalized as well mm. uh, within you that you, you started blaming yourself too. I wanted okay. to pitch in if I could. Yeah. Um, because similar things happened to me too. But the, the thing with me is that I didn't manage to escape. I'm sorry. Um, so like it, it, it was, I think it took me years to kind of um, process it and to sort of acknowledge it, what it is exactly, because a lot of times it was just kind of like me sort of like, but I went to his place, I kind of, you know, all these things and, you know, I did say no and, you know, all these different, different things. And I think this is why conversations such as these are really, really important, not only to talk about our experiences, but also to empower ourselves too, as, as, as women, as society, as Malaysians, to, to know that you're not alone. And, and whatever you're going through. And I really, really love, and I almost teared up when Kira, you were saying, it is your right to be safe. And that's such a powerful thing. And, and you know, I really, truly almost teared up. Actually, I'm feeling it too right now because just listening to Ira's story and just me going back to that time and me multiple times when I would meet dates and then I would just like, actually, I don't feel right in my body. I don't feel good. I want to say no, nope, and they keep pushing for it. Um, when I was younger, I would always be like, oh, but I'm uncool if I say no. You know, or, or they would find me unattractive. I should be, uh, especially I'm a curvy girl. I'm a curvy woman. I should be thankful that they've chosen me. You know, it was all of that sort of, I should be thankful. This is free, you know, and they're so hot. Um, but at the end of the day, now that I, as an adult, I'm in my 30s, I finally realized that, no, you know, it is a privilege to be with me and it is a privilege for me to be with you too. And if you do not respect that, then I'm going to walk out. Easier said than done for sure, but it takes years and years of practice and years and years of building self-worth and self-empowerment. So that's why I'm really happy that we're having this conversation. We have viewers who are here today and also on Facebook Live and also on Zoom to have this conversation so yeah thanks for sharing your story era because i prompted me to share mine as well terrified i'm so sorry that had to happen to you as well just that does sound pretty traumatizing and you did a very very brave step at sharing this story here today hopefully this version of yourself you know being able to look back at the that previous version of yourself and give her the strength and empowerment she needed to hear at that point of time that that very um, negative self-talk you had towards yourself could be a product of the many years of listening and normalizing rape culture as well so we are allowing the toxicity to get to our lives right so I think I call on a very important point um, you guys have repeatedly mentioned as well easier said than done the unlearning has to has to keep going continuously gradually it's not something that could change overnight right it's not like okay we had this conversation today and everybody um, after today, would there definitely be a very strong 
advocate for their own body. I mean, it's most, hopefully we have the awareness, but to implement that change, to really feel confident in your own skin and to feel like, you know, you do not owe anyone that autonomy over your body is definitely a gradual step, right? So Kirit, I was hoping that you would like to share a little bit of what you think it's so important. And how can we begin this step at unlearning toxic culture? So um, thank you so much, Ira and Jasmine. Um, I know vulnerability is courageous, you know, and thank you for sharing um, your stories. Um, I think that um, why we as women are brought up in the culture of patriarchy, right? Especially in our culture, um, women are taught that our value is rooted in how attractive we are, right? Simultaneously, how attractive we are sexually, as well as how chaste we are, you know? You, you, you are either, you, you have to be sexy, but you have to be not sexy also at the same time. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> and this is, this is an impossible task, right? One person cannot be these two things at the same time, right? So, um, and we are taught that our value in life is how desired we are by, by men, you know? Um, and this is not the case, right? We, our value resides in how we treat people. Our value resides in how we go through life, the things that we do. Our value is removed from how other people see us or view us, you know? It's a very inside, um, it's an inside process you know, that needs to be validated by outside forces in your life, right? Your friends, your family, this is, it's important for these people around you to be, to, to, to understand that as well, to understand that um, you are, your value is not whether or not you're going to get married. Your value is not whether or not you have a partner. Your value is what you, what you accomplish with your hard work. Um, I think, um, I totally relate to Jasmine, you know, in being a fat person myself, right? So suddenly somebody desiring you is like, whoa, okay, um, maybe this is something uh, that is special, you know, or, or that I should be thankful. Uh, but that's not the case, right? Um, you are a privilege, right? Your, 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 your body uh, is a privilege. It's a privilege for other people to take your time. So the more I think that um, individually, um, we understand our value um, and we practice it every day. And this starts with normal things in life, not in a sexual relationship straight away. Spending time with friends, right? Some days you just don't have it in you. You just don't have it in you. Are you, are you practicing and saying, no, I need to prioritize my care at this moment? You know, um, maybe going to, picking a restaurant to go to right? Um, this is always a, a big problem in every friend group. Um, are you taking into account everybody's preferences, everybody's um, uh, food requirements? Or are you always just like anything, lah? you know? And, and, and some days it's okay to be anything, but it's important for you to have a say. It's practice, right? That's why we call it the practice of consent. Um, when, you, when you're at the office, um, if you lean over somebody's table, Okay. Let's say you are, you're a guy and you're, you lean over your female colleague's table. Did you ask her if it's okay you lean over her like that? Is that making her uncomfortable? Are you aware of your body? You know, and how your body can make somebody else uncomfortable? Just because you have uh, a different boundary, that doesn't mean everybody has the same boundary as you. Some people are okay even if you hold their hand, right? Or if you give them a cuddle, they're okay with that. Some people... They don't like you coming within two feet of them, you know? So we have to take on that onus of asking people, hey, is it okay? Can I lean over you? Let me just show you this. And if they're not okay, they'll be like, oh, let me just stand up and you can sit, right? So you give that person that room to say, oh, sorry, no, I, I'm not comfortable with this. And our, resp our responsibility towards each other is to ensure that we practice this culture of consent. Right. Um, with children, with children is something so important. Right. Um, how many of us have seen a child being forced to hug someone? <laughs> I've seen it. Right. Especially now in COVID times, I've seen my own niece where she's one 
and people are just like oh let me touch her you know when she clearly is like crying and she's like no please please don't get me <laughs> right but people ignore it so how are we as individuals practicing this consent um like for my niece she can't advocate for herself yet she cries loudly that's how she advocates for herself yet but people ignore it right that crying her saying no is her advocating for herself she's saying i don't want you to come near me but we because of the way we've been brought up the way we've we've sort of thought of children as property you know that they don't have a say of their own we ignore that consent we ignore her boundary yeah so this is how it starts right if you see somebody um if you see somebody not practicing this culture of consent you know say something right um i i just want to say that um i love jasmine's approach of hey um you can't do this because it is not right but i just want you to know that i understand how much labor that is you know that's emotional labor <laughs> that is time you know don't feel like you have to you know generally don't feel like you have to educate someone um when you can't because you need to take care of yourself as well if you can great but if you can't that's okay too that other person needs to just learn how to accept the boundary you know there's no negotiation there's no negotiation once somebody says no there's really no room for negotiation you just have to be like yeah okay yeah um yeah, and not pry we, on the boundaries over there correct you know mm -hmm. um people think that um have you ever had uh, or gone out on a date um and somebody's like please 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 right or oh, anything anything please please that is that is not respecting a boundary right it may seem harmless but it's and it is a a, a process of wearing you down if you have to wear someone coercion. down coercion coercion yeah africa consent coercion exactly right um and if you have to wear someone down that's not consent yeah <laughs> if you have to negotiate really hard that's not consent you know it's supposed to be enthusiastic it's supposed to be easy right um and don't take it personally sometimes stuff is not about you if somebody says no it's not about you they might just not be feeling it at that moment whatever that no is for right uh yeah so i think we um as as a feminist this is my duty lah you know um i talk about it so for example when somebody comes to my niece i'm like she doesn't she doesn't want she's crying so just please leave her alone you know so i am like <laughs> helping her maintain her boundary so we step in you know um like for ira um if if you're in a club you know you you see somebody who's really drunk you know what do you do you go and be like hey are you okay can i take you somewhere take you somewhere safe you know um i've had this happen to me in 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 a club bathroom i've seen somebody who's really drunk who's really like out of it and we've taken her home to her safe, to her wherever her safe space is right because that person is vulnerable be an active bystander that's so important you know um sometimes if if you cannot do anything else record the situation you know that usually helps um deter people because there is proof there is evidence um so think about your safety before stepping in as well your safety in your capacity is also important uh yeah thank you so much thank you so much kira for really elaborating on that and i really like how you are addressing how we can collectively break down these barriers together and how we can advocate for each other to be better advocates of our own boundaries sometimes like what kira has mentioned as well it's really hard for us to advocate for our own boundary many times as well when especially when we're in um intimate relationships or we are in a relationship where the other person is quite significant to us it's really hard to reiterate the boundary many times you know feeling slow and emotions and we have a we 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 feel bad you know so sometimes yeah. we do give in and everything can i add a bit more yes sorry okay so that's a really good point um so the other thing i wanted to add on when it comes to consent is um think about the power difference between two people right mm -hmm. um uh in any relationship let's say it's in a working space right and you are um you are speaking you are speaking to your supervisor right um if you are a supervisor understand that 
your subordinate is going to sort of defer to you. You know, you as your responsibility is to make room for your subordinate to be able to tell you exactly what they think, what they feel, right? Similar in a relationship, um, you know, because of the way our society is structured, um, men have literally physically sometimes more power than us, uh, actually societally more power than us, right? So as men, you must understand that, you know, um, a lot of the time men feel upset when women, uh, step away from them, let's say in a lift, right? Um, you step away from, you step away from a, a, a guy. I don't know. I don't know about y'all, but when a random person, a random man enters the lift, I am on high alert, right? Um, but that is because you, you do not understand the power that you have, the privilege that you have, you know, that, um, and how, 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 how unsafe I feel. With, your, with you being there. I understand that maybe you do not mean me any harm, but that doesn't, my body doesn't know that, you know, it's almost instinctive that you protect yourself, right? Um, so it's important for us to understand that, that privilege, you know, um, whether it's in a workplace setting, whether it's in a relationship, whether it's between adults and children, this is so important. The power, that's, that's where um, the misuse of power occurs. And, cons when, and consent is ignored, right? That's how violence occurs. When somebody, when somebody who has power makes that choice to misuse that power to harm someone, that's the breaking point. That is the cause of gender-based violence. Yeah, thanks, Jean. No worries. So the power imbalance dynamic is really, really important because that's really what perpetuates rape culture in the first place. Mm -hmm. So speaking about that, speaking about advocating how, about how we can contextualize our discussion today, I'm wondering, you know, for, for uh, both Jasmine and Ira over here, how do you think is the best way forward to continue our conversation on advocating for women autonomy and how do we gradually break down the misogynistic view of rape culture? Well, I think it's, it's of course... <laughs> <laughs> A fifth speaker presented the chat. I see that. <laughs> <laughs> um, content education, right? Um, because content education builds emotional literacy, it builds resilience. Um, and then there's this other thing about teaching what it means to be a real man, right? Mm -hmm. If we're in this patriarchal society, there's these thoughts about being a oh, real man is dominant, real man is strong, real man is blah, blah, blah. But it's not. It's not that a real man is... It, it, it being a real man, it doesn't involve um, not dominance, it's democracy. Like we have to treat each other with humanity. We're all equally important. What we want, what we need are all equally important. And you have a right always to say yes and no on how you're being touched, addressed, and what you're allowing to the space. Like human interactions are complex. Communicating boundaries feels a lot of times really awkward. I hate having these conversations sometimes but it would be a disservice to myself and what I value if I didn't tell someone what the limits are when it comes to this is how you are going to be with me. Um, and then outside of gender-based violence, it doesn't, like it applies to, to friendships, it applies to work, um, even on, on social and Instagram, like people have access to details in certain aspects of your life, but it doesn't mean boundaries and consent does not apply. So I think that's kind of, you know, and of course, we could definitely go into an entire conversation about the learning gap for sex, sexuality and sexual health, but that's an entirely different call that we're going to make. All right. <laughs> um, Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have more to add? Yeah. Just that the basics of consent should also be taught to us when we're very young as well. Like what Kirith was saying, you know, kids really mm -hmm. don't have um they, they they don't know how to communicate that it's not okay and they don't they don't feel safe the only thing that you can do is really, really look at them and if they're crying and screaming yeah don't step away stop cute but don't need to really right recognize um, the signs that they are uncomfortable with the situation yeah, and, and i think another another part is um i i also want to want to talk about how guys also need to help us with this and and really be part of that conversation. A friend of mine actually last couple of weeks 
he he's he was saying that he was saying that you know like he's it's just come to him how scared and fearful a lot of women are in our interactions and the things that we do that you know there are certain places that we can we can't walk at night that they would just walk through and not feel any kind of fear um and this this mentality has to also be changed by how they talk to their peers yeah right so one it starts by translating and acting out the boundaries we still want people to respect because obviously it starts with us and two is how can we be better bystanders not just you know someone who's just actively looking at the site, but as uh, people who are here admittedly on the, on a better privilege um, trail, then it's so important for us, for them to acknowledge the privilege they have and also advocate for our autonomy and our rights and how we in return are advocating for the autonomy of children as well. So it really is like a community helping community kind of system going on, right? We need everyone involved in this change to keep a train going. We can't be solely the only one advocating. Like there's only a amount of times uh, Jasmine could tell young boys of social media how many times that they should or shouldn't send those little photos over. So that's, those are really great points. I think it's one, it's so important to start from ourselves. And two, how can we educate the entire society to each be better um, bystanders towards each other? How about women um, supporting women though? Like so many times we also see that women are one of the voices that's perpetrating the victim blaming culture, you know, things that could be so simple, like, you know, don't wear that or, or like bring a jacket after your yoga class because, you know, I'm not going to this place with you if you're dressed like that, something like that. Like how, how, do, we, how do we fight against that? Or better support women as well? So... <laughs> So sometimes what I do is I don't, I like asking people questions. Right. So like, I'll just like, why do you feel that way? Why do you feel it's important for us to do that way? Do you feel like there's a gap in this? Why, why do you feel women uh, should be responsible for, for things like this, where it's actually, it's actually probably anybody, like, you mm. know, anybody would, would do this to us, but then we are, you know more often than not victims and you know I would just have a conversation with them because sometimes I just kind of wanted to understand how they think how certain people think because again I mean all these things are something that has been you know ever since we were young so it's a kind of a conditioning that we sort of had you know that they also had we also had and I had to go through I mean to be frank like when I was growing up a lot of times this is what I've been fed my grandparents tell me this my grandma tell me this, my uncle auntie everybody tells me this and you know there's just something clicked in me where I was just like this is something wrong and so I started questioning so I think like I mean to answer the question of like well what how you know other women would say things like that other women would have this kind of like toxic you know just rape culture sort of ideas and so yeah, just asking them why and just, just seeing how they sort of process. Also, I love having conversations with men, um, with men who sort of have similar, you know, ideas of like they, they normalize rape culture and all of that, but also men who really definitely find rape culture is a huge problem. Um, I love having um, men, especially straight cis men or like um, bi men or trans men, I need to have more LGBT on my panel, but I love just having them come on and just talking from their point of view, because a lot of times we hear women talking so openly about all of this, but it's really interesting when you have men kind of come in and I remember like one of my previous panel, I had two of my guy friends come in and it was very healing for other men who were in that call as well because they thought they were only the only one thinking this way you know they think that they're not men enough because they do not you know be a certain way of what society deems them should tell them to be and to have other men to kind of come up here actually be proud of your size whatever the size is just be proud of it and you know you're not any less of a man because of so and so and so it was very healing for them and it was also very healing for women who are there as well who have always been told that men are dangerous men are scary and to have straight cis men for example to come in and say like actually we're here and we actually don't agree a lot of the things that society perpetuates onto you know like men women gender roles and all these things um so yeah Normally I would ask questions and just play the dumb person and also include everybody in the conversation. 
Um, I think that's great. I think your experience when you were sharing, you know, hearing perspectives of men as well, I think it's it actually sheds the different light of them. Like it shows that they are vulnerable as well. Like many times, maybe we see them being really persistent and being very desperate as a form of, uh, as a way they would want to protect their ego. But deep down, actually, they, they feel less of a man if they don't act a certain way or they don't say a certain thing or don't adhere to a certain social standard. So if we acknowledge that as well, then maybe we're able to show them like, hey, we're here, we are listening to you, we're hearing you. Just because you don't do this doesn't make you less of a man. I'm just, it's not you. It's nothing personal. I'm just not comfortable. It's me. So like we show them like, you know, it's, hopefully this is not a blow to your ego whatsoever. And you don't find the need to continue to harass women anymore. If yeah. I could just add to um, that topic about how we would kind of address it with women, right? I think that mm -hmm. um, possibly a lot of women feel a sense of sexual shame, right? Yeah. They doubt mm -hmm. their own sexual desires. They don't feel confident and empowered in, in, in themselves and how they present the sexuality. And that could potentially perceive their right in protecting their, their selves. Um, yeah, it, it affects their perception, sorry, of the, the right that they have to protect themselves in the sexual relationships, where it's like, if I am too, if I'm, if I dress too sexy or if I act too sexy, then again, it goes back to like, mm, maybe I shouldn't be like that. Like it's, it's I don't know, a, a sense of shame, right? Yeah. Yeah. It and comes from that, the voices that, around this. Yeah, I think if, if it was a girl that I was with that felt like, oh, you know, like maybe I shouldn't wear this or maybe you shouldn't wear this going there. And I'll be I'll probably ask them this, like, I'll be curious the same way Jasmine is on why do you feel that you need to hide who you are and who you want to be and how you want to express yourself? Mm -hmm. And yes, probably the answer will come to is that it's fear. Many times yeah. we are deciding based on that. Yes. Yeah. Can I just jump in on that? So um, I think a, um, a lot of women uh, subscribe to these rape myths is survival, right? Um, mm -hmm. Oftentimes when um, gender-based violence occurs, everyone wants to know why it happened. Yeah. Um, and attached to that, that, that sexual shame um, is women's uh, honor, her family's honor, it's all in the woman's vagina, right? They've, they've attached it there, you know? So when, when sexual assault occurs, um, it, is not, it is, does not only affect um, um, the, the survivor, it also affects the family, right? That's the, that's the mentality that, that we have as a society, right? Um, so when people buy into um, rape culture, it is a sense of, is it is a way to make sense of something that they don't understand. You know, it's because you wore the sexy baju. It's because you went out late at night, and it's because you drank. That's why this happened to you. I don't do any of these things, so it won't happen to me. Right? It's a it's it's a way of protecting themselves. You know, when the reality is that's not why sexual assault occurs. That's not why gender-based assault, gender-based violence occurs, right? It occurs because of that imbalance of power. You know, a perpetrator sees an opportunity, decides to take that opportunity. You know, um, so it's a it's a sort of like distancing mm. from a survivor, right? Because we always think that could never happen to me. Yeah, so I think once we unpack that mm. um, and we understand why um, gender-based violence occurs, um, we are able to sort of um, demystify rape myths, you know, um, and we see mm. that they actually don't make any sense and that, that they're not, they not correct. Mm. Yeah. I think a lot of what Kira says as well, it reminds me of how our society really builds on the whole prevention is better than cure approach. Like yes. if you just avoid completely, here are the common factors we see usually in people who have been sexually assaulted or sexually abused. If we could avoid those, those, those incidences, then maybe, maybe you wouldn't be raped or maybe you wouldn't be harassed as well. So yeah, but it goes, it goes bigger than that because we can try to cover all the factors. But if someone wants to hurt you, 
they will hurt you, right? All right, yeah. thank you so much for all the very, very interesting insights and how raw and authentic you, you guys are. I think I really learned a lot from all your insights and experiences as well. And I am enjoying this conversation so much. But unfortunately, running in the interest of time, we have a lot of questions coming in from the public, which have some of them have been specifically addressed to our respective speakers. So I'm just going to dive right onto it. So um, this is directed to Ira and Jasmine, actually. Have such invasive comments or questions on your platform ever made you feel hesitant about being in the public eye? And if so, how do you cope with it? <laughs> um, okay, so when that thing happened to me and then I got that really disgusting comment, um, I was just taken aback and angry. Um, I very, I don't usually, I'm not, I try not to be too vulnerable on the platform. I don't really, I'm not the kind that would like take videos and like cry and stuff, but I actually did because I felt it was really important to share what that kind of comment and how it affects me and how it, I, I was essentially attacked, right? And then um, I went off for a while. I was quiet for, I think a week because I couldn't go back there I felt um, this weird sense of shame that this bad ha bad thing had happened to me. And then I chose to share it so that other people would have an, a sense of awareness that this does happen and, it, and people do get affected by it. And then it went into this weird shame of mm -hmm. why did I open myself up like that? Um, should I maybe have shut up about it? and not call that person out. In fact, I actually felt bad that I actually posted the person's account. Of course, it was a fake account, um, but I had all these mixed feelings and then I stayed away for a little while, just, I think, just to process. Um, but that didn't deter me, no, I think to answer the question, it didn't really deter me from being back up there because if not for that, then people wouldn't know how um, toxic that, interaction was really yeah all right that's really something like we it's, it's almost like the story you mentioned earlier how un unconsciously and unintentionally be, you began blaming yourself as well to allow like you you asked yourself if you ever did something to allow for that to happen now i'm really sorry that I had to come to that but i'm wondering you know how did you find yourself coping differently right now instead um, I think, you know, after this is like what we've been saying is that it's just conditioning yeah. for so long that awareness really helps when something happens, taking that and going, okay, how do I really feel about this? How do I want to respond to this? Taking a minute, not rushing into it and trying my very best to disassociate from it, like if, in a bad way. And not not really um, blaming any part of that interaction uh, on myself, yeah. But it, it takes there's a few steps. Like it, it really does take a lot of awareness for for me at least, maybe mm -hmm. because of past past things that have, that have happened. Mm -hmm. But it's it's about being aware and mindful and understanding that it is really our right to whatever people uh, come come at us with right and All to right. put up a boundary yeah the unlearning bit is really a long and, and challenging part it's it's we say it easily you know how do we unlearn how do we unlearn but it's many years and it's ongoing isn't it it's it's like we, we can try to be strong and we can try to assert our boundaries but all we need is just that one time when we are feeling slightly vulnerable and someone with a stronger you know um, status imbalance comes in and try to violate our boundary and that's it we might feel like we're back to that pattern where we, we just don't know what to do but that awareness and this kind of conversation I really hope it gives you the strength and empowerment to keep the good fight going on you know to continue yeah. to stand up for yourself as well and, and I think if anyone on you know watching feels that way the same way it's okay really you you always think that you're kind of over the hill and then sometimes you go back and maybe when you go back, bring a different perspective to it. And like, I guess be kind 
to yourself in anything that comes up in your head and like address it and and really objectively look at it yeah yeah be kind to yourself that is so important you know always understand that you're probably a better version of yourself today than you were yesterday and you are constantly evolving as well with your experiences it's great um how about you Jasmine? um i got really pissed off i was just <laughs> like do you <laughs> love um, the honesty <laughs> yeah i was i was really pissed off i was just very like how dare you kind of come into your space just because i talk about sexual wellness doesn't give you any sort of right to then come like oh go come and see my penis right and then if i say like no i'm not interested in seeing that I'm like oh but i thought you talk about sexual health and then what I, so you got a problem is it like with my penis now and i was like i got a problem with your penis i didn't ask for it um so um i would just pop i used to i used to post whatever whatever messages i get on my stories and i used to block their names but nowadays i don't i don't really care i just post their names and everything like that um because it's really a lot of it has to do with just raising awareness that there are people like this who are this way and not to be afraid of it. Um, I, I know that it's, it's really traumatic for me. As when I first started, it was just very, it really disturbed me. And then as the years go by, I think just the, the angry I get. And I think what made me more angry is knowing that I probably am not the only person that I've actually approached, that I've actually approached other women out there as well. And, and I was angry for those women who, who, you know, might not be, you know, in a very, in a state where I am, where I'm just like, you know, I'm just, I was just angry for, for the women. So I would just post it up and I would then take it into, it become a content law. Then I would create this whole like post about like, you know, if this happens, um, don't be scared or don't be whatever, just be angry because it's your worth and they're questioning everything and it's not your fault. You know, they want to uh, unsolicited dick pics and you know all these different things in fact it actually fired me up to go for my purpose and in my work you know it really really made everything clearer on why I do the things that I do why I do the work that I do if anything right so that took a lot of courage as well probably and it takes a lot of mental space too because what you have been doing is this active ongoing work, right? To try to break things down. And also how do you like ensure that while you're trying to have this kind of conversations, how are you taking care of yourself and making sure that, you know, this, this work that you're doing, trying to break down the myth is not overstraining your mental health as well. Yeah. I think when I first started, I wanted to reply everybody and I had, and I feel real, feel guilty. And I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm not doing my part if I'm not able to turn people. Then I realize we can't help everybody and I need to be okay within myself and within my body that I can't help anybody, everybody, right? Mm -hmm. And so now I, I just have my, my favorite button, which is the block button. <laughs> I just like, um, sometimes I'll just read, 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 okay, this is a waste of time. I'll just block it. If I feel like I want to engage in talk to them, have a conversation. And then, you know, after a while, I'm like, okay, this is not going anywhere. I'll just block it. So, and I don't have any emotions and feelings because again, it's a privilege to have access to, to us, to ourselves. And they of all people, they have a privilege towards us, to have access mm -hmm. to us. And that comes with self-respect, something that I think a lot of us are still also struggling with. But I think to be aware of it, to know and repeatedly tell yourself, like, it's me. It's my boundary, it's my body, it's up to me to decide how I want it to be treated. I think that level of awareness definitely will get us somewhere, right? And taking care of our own boundaries too. Yeah, I wanted to also really quickly to say that mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, like um, harassment online, so these are forms of harassment, right? They're like online mm -hmm. um, harassment. So sometimes harassment, when you think of harassment, we think about like really people saying bad things, like really horrible things, like you're horrible, you're this, you're this, you're this. But sometimes there are different type of har harassment where they're actually sugarcoating, where they're actually saying all these nice things, you're amazing, you're this, why can't you, you know, and everything. And I often confuse that with, you know, nice gestures, but then I realize that it's actually also harassment. Um, mm -hmm. They're trying to be, uh, a bad person but like in a good way the nice bad person if that makes sense so yeah so, so, that's, that's an extra obstacle to have to deal with isn't it 
Yeah. And how do we feel then? And, and you know, make sure that we are standing up against them respectfully. At the same time, trying to gauge, you know, is this your real intention? What seems to be your hidden agenda? Yeah. Well, we are on that topic on how we can stand up for ourselves. Yet at the same time, making sure that we are taking care of our mental health as well. Coincidentally, there are some questions on that from our viewers too. And you know, feel free to chime in, um, anyone. But how do we ensure that we are able to have this kind of ongoing conversation with people um, who seems to be a little bit more mis misogynistic while ensuring that your own personal safety and mental health stay intact? So I like the blog block thing you say there um jasmine like you know that you know there is a certain limit you you will go and after that if you go beyond my limit and my threshold that's it i'm going to hit the block button so that that's a good one does anyone have anything else to share um so maybe i can add um so within my work um i meet a lot of different types of people um and some people are more difficult than others <laughs> um i think um if someone is misogynistic um and so if someone is misogynistic, but they're willing to learn, um, they are willing to have a conversation, they, uh, they have an open mind to sort of um, unlearn some of the behaviors, you can tell, right? You can tell when somebody is interested in listening to you and listening to what you have to say. Um, I then would engage, you know? Um, I might not, um, maybe if it's difficult for me to engage in person, I might send reading material, things for them to watch on YouTube, other resources apart from me, myself, just to sort of get them onto the right track of unlearning more, right? Mm -hmm. But there are some people who are not interested in engaging with you uh, and meeting you where you are, right? Um, they just want to be right. They are not interested in um, unpacking their misogyny. They, they, they want to be misogynistic. Um, and for to practice my own boundaries, right, um, to maintain my mental health, I just don't engage. I think um, the energy that I spend on this person is much better um, utilized on myself to do nothing or with people <laughs> who um, are unconvinced, who are in the middle. You know what I mean? Um, so I sort of pick and choose who I choose to engage with. Um, when I was younger, I definitely fought with everyone. Um, I, I definitely always am engaging whether or not that person is um, willing to listen or not, right? Uh, but as I learn, um, and I wish I learned it sooner, um, with some people, you just don't have to waste that energy. You know, save it. Save the energy for yourself. Save the energy for other people. Yeah. Um, so this is how I, I am honest with myself and I take care of myself. Right, that's great. Similar approach to, to Jasmine's as well. Like you acknowledge what's your level and your threshold and you stop and you, um, stop engaging for anyone who goes beyond that. Mm -hmm. Would you say the same as well, Yura? Yeah, I mean, we're here talking about consent and consent works both ways, right? So yeah. if I consent to unlearning whatever I need to unlearn, then you have the right to consent to yours um yep. and some people are just not ready i like that idea of sending them the resources and not getting emotionally um invested in, in a conversation with with them and and having your own personal views um if they are ready to oh they like oh, they just watched what kira sent and then they said oh man i didn't realize this was going on and this really affects me what can i do about it okay then we start talking yes. yeah yeah right but everyone has um, their journey with it and I mean mm -hmm. I think what we need to focus on is communicating with people who are ready and there are many it's just that a lot of them are silent and they don't know where to start they don't know who else is talking about it they don't feel like it's a safe conversation to be had so I think the important thing is to look at those people first before we start going to people who are just completely resistant and and rooted in their misogyny right so building on that yes can, sorry, can i add a bit more i think that's a really good point some people think that it's not a safe conversation to be had because mm -hmm. whenever you talk about consent um sometimes people ask questions uh, questions that you feel are questions they shouldn't ask 
right? Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes um, they maybe have bought into a rape myth and things like that. Um, I think it's important for them to feel safe to ask those questions with you, you know? So learning, this is a privilege, right? Being, being able to have access to these outside resources is a privilege. Mm-hmm. So we also need to make room for people who don't have that privilege or who haven't, who hasn't, haven't been able to engage in this sort of discussion. So, you know, making space for people to ask, you know, um, difficult questions. Remember, I remember when I was a baby feminist, I also had problematic news, you know? I asked weird questions. So we need to make sure to create space for that. Yeah, that's really that's nice. And that's so honest for you to share. So we're all learning um, according to our journeys, right? But you know, that part about what you guys said about, you know, engaging in, in people who might be a bit more resistant, that might be a challenge. And so we start by people who are more curious first, who are open to learning. Building on that conversation, though, I think this is a really important question that our viewers have addressed as well. How do we begin by discussing about consent? Is there something else? Sorry, my, my Siri. <laughs> <laughs> Building on that, how do we start by engaging the conversation of patriarchy, breaking down patriarchy and talking about consent with like people like say our family members who are probably not aware about this and most importantly, the males in our circle. Wow, that's a tough one. (laughs) How do we begin by broaching the subject? How how about about, um, you guys share how you do it? So my father is a cranky old man, uh, a cranky old man who is holding on to some, <laughs> you know, um, difficult, problematic views. Um, so how I have begun to approach it is um, I, I challenge him on, on it, you know. So I do what Jasmine does. I'll be like, so why do you think this way? Do you know, actually, it's actually like this, like this, like this, you know. I, do, I, I try not to go at it from a place of anger, you know, uh, more so from a place of curiosity to sort of understand actually what he means, you know, or what his point is. And then I slowly try to chip away at it bit by bit, bit by bit, you know. Um, Family is the hardest. Sometimes I choose not to engage because I just don't have it in me, you know. Um, And sometimes I just have to accept that this is how he's going to think, and I have to, what I do is I make it very clear that I don't agree with him, right? I make it very clear I don't agree with him. And he knows that, you know, um, and we've come to that uneasy agreement that we won't disagree with each other on this certain topic or whatever. Um, obviously, I have the, pri- the privilege of being able to speak to my father in a frank way, you know, so you have to assess for yourself how safe that is you know, and how much uh, mental space you have, emotional space you have, because any conversation with family can become an emotional job, you know, so you, you, you have to assess yourself. Sometimes I also share resources or I make him watch a movie, you know, uh, in really soft ways to sort of try and change his mind. Yeah. That's great. So slowly and, and test waters beat by beat, don't just offload like a huge chunk of information, yes. right? All right. How about um, Ira and Josephine? Uh, I have the privilege of, um, in my family, the women are the matriarchs, so I really have to, (laughs) a lot of time, (laughs) the hard work, uh, my siblings and stuff. Um, But I will speak about friends, um, male friends. So I found that a lot of times when, you know, we feel we're put in positions where, um, you know, we, we, there's, there's been a power play with men, we automatically want to go to the girls and tell the girls because they will understand, they will empathize. So I try to then bring these conversations to the guys and tell them, hey, this happened to me. Not in a way where I'm like victimizing myself also, where it's just, this has happened. I need you to know that this happened. You don't have to, you know, the instinct would be like, oh, I'm coming into a defense for you. And like, you know, the guy will get quite aggressive. Like, no just telling you that this happened i'm not trying to find like any sympathy but I, this is the reality of the situation of being a woman um I, I mentioned earlier um my friend that did say to his guy friend about how i, I didn't realize up to this point that you know girls have to go through this and this fear da, da, da. 
And I said, yeah, so this is the reason why we need to talk more about this. Me and you and, and you and your guy friends. And, and yeah, I, I think having those conversations, telling them what the, what the deal is, what you, what you actually go through um, and, and helping them understand what they can do to improve the situation. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a nice approach as well. It's basically we are just saying we are we just want to talk. We don't need change. We just want to talk. Change will come gradually at your own pace after you receive the information. Mm. That's a great one. So we are giving them autonomy to decide what they want to do with that piece of information. Again, consent. Yeah, I'm like not right. telling you how, but mm-hmm. just know this is happening and what you feel in the next situation that you come to where you can do something different and, and, you know, lend to this cause, go and do that, mm. right? Right. How about you, Jasmine? Do you have a different approach or something similar as well? Um, I, I think it's a bit of both of what uh, Kirit and you I was talking about. Uh, I try, I tend, I think it's a thing with the thing with my friends, um, to just kind of get to like, you know, the info. Sorry, Jasmine, you know, yeah, your mic is breaking a little bit. Yeah. yeah, we lost you. Is this better? Oh no, no, I think it's a mic issue. Maybe you might want to unplug the microphone and you know just speak to the device and see if that works. You know? Oh yeah, yeah much better. Okay. Oh no. Okay. So um, I guess for me, it's kind of the same approach as Ira and Kirit as well. Like I mean, with friends, I tend to tell like I tend to process things with my male friends mm-hmm. and try to kind of gauge mm-hmm. hello yeah. Yes, yes. yeah to kind of gauge with their thoughts with my male friends um and then with family I tend to pick and choose who I can talk to about certain things because I think older generation is quite tough for them to understand. Mm-hmm. And so you pick and choose your Bethel. <laughs> so um, I tend to talk to my cousins a lot and sort of um, my younger cousins, especially sort of educate, but also sort of ask where they're at in their life and how do they look at things and you know, kind of the things. And yeah, those are the kind of conversations I sort of have. And of course, through my platform and so on and so forth. But yeah, yeah, pick and choose your battle. Um, and also talk to people within your circle, especially your circle, because it's important to have a circle of influence. Um, people kind of support you because then it empowers you as opposed to talking to people who do not sort of understand and you know you kind of have to fight your way and it's just going to be very discouraging instead of empowering that's true we don't force anyone to change if they're not ready to or we don't force anyone to hear us out if they don't want to as well so yeah pick and choose your battles instead now we are on to our last question for today i'm so sorry this dragged out a little bit longer than expected but for the last question actually it's a combination of two questions over here it's actually um our viewers sharing some personal experiences of them having to battle um the rape culture unfortunately that existed in their own interpersonal relationship so for these two questions um and basically long story short it's about how um they were in relationship where the the demand that they were with did not make them feel safe about expressing themselves and they have gradually asserted their own boundaries and as a result of that um the guy has tried to test you know um violating the boundary and test by saying that person is ever ready for sex again and that caused one of our viewers a lot of anxiety and distress now her question is to ask can victims or survivors believe that the perpetrators say they've changed and won't repeat their behaviors again and they have really learned better is like what do you guys think about this um i is it okay if i go first yes so yeah i think um just based on um just based on the information that i have Mm -hmm. um when you already told this person that like look I don't feel comfortable with this. Mm. Uh, I'm not interested in speaking to you anymore. But then they, after you've asserted a boundary um, and then they apologize, but then they continue to test your boundaries. Yeah, yeah. That means that they have not learned to respect your boundaries. 
even though they have skin that they have, right? Um, I think it's very clear that this person does not uh, does not respect your boundaries because if they did, they would listen to you and leave you alone. You know, um, I un- totally understand how this can cause you anxiety and stress, um, and how it can upset you. Um, I think, um, in general, um, uh, perpetrators can change. Anybody can change, but mm-hmm. it's going to take a lot of work. It's going to take a lot of effort, and it's not. It's you change by showing your behavior change, right? Mm-hmm. By, by by not doing the things that you are asked not to do, by respecting the space that you are asked to respect. Mm-hmm. Um, and this person is not doing any of that, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I do believe that perpetrators can change, but they need to put in a lot more work and the change has to be reflected through the behavior. You know, yeah. this the constant violation of your boundaries cannot repeat. You know, mm-hmm. um, yeah. So they have so to they show are. you that, not just say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do any of you else have anything else to add to that? I I think for me personally, um, it's it's definitely wanting to tell someone your boundary. It's another to really practice that boundary and really holding your boundary. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say exactly whatever Kira was saying, completely, completely agree or echo what she says. Mm-hmm. I think when it comes to sort of the person not respecting your boundary, it's really, it's not nice, it's not fun. But at the same time, you can't really control what the person is kind of doing, but what you can control is how you sort of deal with the situation. So in this case, just by judging from the story that you kind of shared, it feels that that person has access to you constantly. So like kind of you already said very firmly no, and then the person keeps on pushing and pushing and you're constantly like moving your boundary over and over again. So I guess that's why they feel like, oh no, okay, I can, I can really push, I can really push, I can be really do not respect their boundaries. So I feel like, for you, what you can do, just a suggestion, is, is just really sort of standing firm and just telling them an ultimatum. I don't know, like, if you say, if you do this one more time, I'm not going to talk to you and really mean it. Mm. Too. Again, it's wanting to tell someone your boundary. It's another to assert the boundary, but it's a whole other thing when you practice that boundary and just really stand firm. And sometimes it's really hard because they are your romantic partners. This is your ex partner, and you have memories and you know all these things. But they did this for me and everything. But uh, hey, again, it's a privilege to have access to you, and they do not respect that. So yeah, just like really standing firm and. And don't let them push that boundary. Again, easier says than done takes a lot of practice, practice of consent. A lot of not enabling that person to have access to you without respecting your boundaries, right? Now, in terms um, in to, to, to continue this, this question as well, you know, another viewer has asked a similar question where the viewer asked that, um, do you think there is any possibility at all for a couple uh, to move forward in their relationship, especially if there are history of being um, violated before, like like this case? And if so, what do you think they can do to continue to heal forward? I think um, when traumatic events like that happen in in relationships, there Mm -hmm. is a sense of broken trust, Um, not just in the trust you have for that person, but the trust you have in yourself. And I think uh, similar to, to that boundary question earlier, it's do you trust that person to change behavior, not do it again? And do you also trust yourself to not allow it in any way, you know? Um, I think that's like a loaded question. Uh, I, I don't personally feel if there has been um, any violence in a relationship, especially physical, um, you shouldn't stay. I've been in relationship where emotional, mental kind of abuse sort of happened and I stayed on only to then realize it broke down every single part of me and I really had to rebuild from there. 
tough process. Not impossible, but then there's this, the way that you look at them and you, you just don't feel safe ever again. Is that something you really want to be in? Yeah. So it, it, you have to really ask yourself, how much do you trust yourself? What kind of level of safety do you feel around this person? If there's any feeling of unsafety at all, like that's probably the red flag. So that's how I would see it. So ultimately, it really depends on how much you are willing to commit to this relationship and how much you are able to hold your own boundaries and respect firm enough to not let the other person step on you ever again. Yeah, yeah. and respecting yourself first of all. Mm. Can I also add that um, when something like this happens and um, consent is not respected, mm. um, I do not think that um, healing can happen when your healing can happen in the relationship. I don't think it's possible because this is your perpetrator. This is the person who has hurt you. So it has to happen outside of that relationship. And you have to go on your own journey to sort of move towards that healing process. And your perpetrator has to go on their own journey towards uh, not being a perpetrator, towards understanding why they behave the way they behave. You know, um, and I don't think this can happen together. Mm. Yeah, that's true. Um, that's so, true. yeah. So when, when more often than not, um, in relationships, the basic tenant of a relationship is safety. You know, mm. and if you don't feel safe, that is not a healthy space already. You know, mm -hmm. um, and looking at um, when abuse happens in a relationship. Um, it doesn't happen one time in one certain form, right? Abuse happens in a cycle, you know? It often begins with um, things that people uh, don't take seriously, you know, like um, uh, degrading comments, things like that. It happens in a cycle and it mm. happens, it escalates, right, to a big, a big thing, a big fight, maybe uh, a big argument. Uh, and then um, something violent will happen, whether it's uh, uh, psychologically abusive or physically abusive, it usually escalates to physical abuse. Yeah. So get out before the beginning, get out at the early stage of this cycle, you know, uh, because this is already not, not good news. It is many red flags. It is a giant red flag. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Kira, for going even a deeper understanding on the cycle of violence, how we see that, you know, not respecting boundaries and um, consent is just the beginning. And that really opens up layers to more um, perpetration of violence on bills to happen in the relationship too. So thanks everyone again for all the wonderful insights and exchanges we had over the past one and a half hours. I believe we have already approached the end of our session today. So sorry to the viewers who have not had the questions answered. We do run on the interest of time. So I do want to add a closing note over here. We had such an intense conversation about consent, respecting autonomy, and you know we do touch on the subject of violence quite a fair bit as well. So building on to that, um, WAO would like to remind all of you that if you personally have ever gone through harassment, abuse or violence in your life and you feel like you, you want to know more about your rights and the options you have to deal with the situation, please, please reach out to us, whether by reaching out to our hotline um, or our crisis text tool. So those numbers have been um, typed in the group chat as well. So reach out to us anytime you could, anytime you feel safe to, to get some advices and support. Otherwise, if you have any other feedback regarding our forum, whether you want more or you have clarifications you'd like to address, our um, chat here is open for a while for you to share those concerns or feel free to email us at info at weu.org.my to share any of the feedbacks you have too. Otherwise, I believe we have reached the end of our session. I'd like to give this massive gratitude and appreciation to our wonderful panelists here today who are so lovely and kind to share their very raw and authentic experiences with us, making this a really fruitful discussion and giving us a lot of to think about and take away um, this weekend. Hopefully nothing too heavy um, that, that will hinder our, our rest. But 
besides that, I'll still like to thank everyone here listening to us as well, you know, giving us the lovely time you had this weekend to hear us talking about consent. We are beginning a conversation to break down this narrative that we have so long been living with and conversations awareness is just the beginning. So that's all from me today. Oh yes, um, last but not least, we do have the link to our publication on the Violence Against Women Attitude Survey. It's right there in our WAO website. Feel free to have a look. It's quite long, um, but it's very detailed and it's quite eye-opening. We are very happy to um, run future forums and trainings to talk more about this in the future. But for now, this is all the time we have today. Thank you very much once again to everybody. And no, if there is no other further concerns, I would like the speakers and panelists say a few words to be goodbye and we are done. Thank you, Jean, for moderating. Thanks, Kirat and Jasmine. Um, yeah, and thanks everyone for tuning in. Catch you on the other platforms. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been such a privilege to speak um, to all of you ladies and also to everyone watching. And thank you so much to WAO for having me as well. I think this is such an important conversation to have. And I'm really, really honored to be part of this very important conversation and also for the study. So important as well. Thank so you. Important. Thank you. Um, thanks, everyone. You are Jasmine and Jean. Um, if you need more information, you know, you can always look us look for more information on our W website, our Instagram, our Twitter. Uh, yeah, I hope everybody after this uh, makes an effort to practice consent in their daily lives. That's true. Well, there's some takeaways from all of, from all of you. Um, as well, I personally am taking a lot from this to to add to my reflections as well. Especially, how do I become a better advocate for practicing consent too? So, thank you all again for this wonderful conversation, and I'll catch you guys next time. <laughs>